In the late 12th century, a fraternity emerged in Acker, formed by German merchants from Bremen and Lübeck, which laid the groundwork for what would later become the Teutonic Order. After taking over a hospital after the city's capture, this group initiated their mission to care for the sick, under the moniker of the Hospital of St. Mary of the German House in Jerusalem, receiving Pope Clement III's blessing. This order swiftly became influential, leveraging control over Arker's port tolls, and eventually became more than just a hospital charity. Despite challenges, the order persisted, maintaining its historical motto, Help, Defend, and Heal, and continuing its charitable events across all of Central Europe. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to see you again, and you already know who I am. If you'd like to support the channel, head on over to the Patreon, where all the videos are ad-free. Otherwise, if you enjoy the content, like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Now, without further ado, on to today's topic, the Teutonic Order, also known as the Teutonic Knights. In the midst of the 12th century, under Pope Calliston II's directive, the Knights Hospitalier took charge of a German hospital in Jerusalem, a sanctuary for the myriad of German pilgrims and crusaders unable to communicate in the local or Latin languages, as recounted by chronicler John de Press. This establishment, while operating under the Hospitallers, was decreed by the Pope to be led by Germans planting the seeds for a German-led religious institution within the kingdom of Jerusalem itself. Following Jerusalem's fall in 1187, merchants from Lübeck and Bremen were inspired to establish a field hospital during the siege of Acre in 1190, laying the foundation for what would later be recognized by Pope Celestine II, third rather, in 1192, as the nucleus of a new order. Emulating the Knights Templar, this fledgling group evolved into a military order by 1198, with the head being designated as the Grand Master. Tasked with crusading to reclaim and protect Jerusalem for Christianity, this transformation marked the order's shift from a hospice for pilgrims to a martial organization, under the guidance of Grand Master Hermann von Salza from 1209 to 1239. The order had its established roots in Acre, acquiring Montfort Castle in 1220 to safeguard the passage between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean. Montfort became the Grand Master's headquarters in 1229, though they eventually retreated into Acre after the castle fell to Muslim forces in 1271. Their reach extended across the Holy Roman Empire, including modern-day Germany and Italy, as well as Francocratia and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, bolstered by many land donations. The relationship with Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, significantly elevated the status of Grand Master Hermann von Salza, making him a prince of the empire and allowing him to engage with other high-ranking nobles as a peer. Von Salza played a notable role during Frederick's coronation as King of Jerusalem in 1225, accompanying the emperor and publicly reading his proclamation in French and German. 
Despite these achievements and their esteemed status, the Teutonic Knights never quite matched the influence of their counterparts. The Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller, at least in the Crusader states. In 1211, the arrival of the Teutonic Knights in Transylvania marked a pivotal moment as King Andrew II of Hungary welcomed their assistance, offering them the district of Berzenland with unprecedented privileges, such as exemption from fees and the right to administer their own justice. This arrangement stemmed from Andrew's connections with the family of Hermann von Salza. Through marital negotiations involving his own daughter and the Thurundrian Landgrave's son. Under the leadership of a knight named Theodoric, or perhaps Dietrich, the order took on the mantle of protecting Hungary's southeastern frontier from the Cumans, constructing numerous forts and introducing German settlers among the existing Transylvanian Saxon community. Their aggressive expansion and fortification efforts, including the construction of stone castles by 1220, however, ignited envy and suspicion among the Hungarian nobility and clergy, who had been previously more or less indifferent to these lands. The return of King Andrew from the Fifth Crusade to a kingdom simmering with discontent over the campaign's cost and failures exacerbated tensions even further. Nobility pressure to retract the knight's privileges had led Andrew to reassess the initial agreement, although initially he stopped short of revoking their rights. Amidst the rising uncertainty about their future under Prince Bela's impending rule, the knights sought to place themselves directly under papal authority in 1224, a move that, unfortunately for them, backfired rather spectacularly. When King Andrew found out about this, he promptly expelled them from the country in 1225. While the ethnic German settlers brought by the order were allowed to stay, becoming part of the Transylvanian Saxons, Hungary was left vulnerable. You see, the expulsion of the knights, who had provided a robust military defense, left the region ill-prepared against the subsequent Cuman incursions. Once again, threatening the peace and security of the southeastern borders. In 1226, amidst the crusading zeal that swept through Western Europe, Duke Conrad I of Masovia, from northeastern Poland, sought the help of the Teutonic Knights to secure his borders against the pagan Baltic Old Prussians. He offered Kelmo land as a base for their operations, a proposal that Hermann von Salza, the Grand Master, saw as an opportunity to hone his knight's skills for future battles in the Holy Land, get a little bit of practice in before the real game begins. The Golden Bull of Rimini, issued by Emperor Frederick II, granted the order special imperial rights over Prussia, including that aforementioned Kelmo land under the guise of papal sovereignty. In a significant expansion of their influence, the knights absorbed the smaller order of Dobirzin in 1235, further cementing their presence in the region and somewhat bolstering their numbers. The campaign to subjugate Prussia unfolded over fifty years, 
marked by intense violence and resistance from native Prussians who fiercely opposed their conquerors. Going as far to execute captured knights in very barbaric medieval rituals. We're talking public executions, racks ripped apart by horses, all manner of medieval imagination. Despite all of this brutality, the conquest eventually led to the formal submission of some Prussian nobles, who saw their privileges reaffirmed by the Treaty of Christberg. However, the repeated Prussian uprisings between 1260 and 83 resulted in the displacement, or resettlement, of much of the Prussian nobility, eroding the rights of free Prussians and leading to a gradual assimilation of the remaining nobles with the German settlers. This period also saw varying degrees of integration and resistance among the Prussian populace, with frontier regions experiencing more freedoms compared to the more settled areas. The imposition of Christianity, while officially aimed at integrating Prussian society into Western Christendom, was met with mixed responses. The local bishops resisted the incorporation of pagan practices into the new faith, whereas the Teutonic rulers found it easier to manage a populace that had the opportunity to retain some of its pagan traditions, albeit in a form that the Christians found a little more palatable. Look at Christmas, for example. Think of things like that. After decades of warfare, the legacy of the Teutonic Knights' conquest of Prussia was largely stripped of its native population. Either through death or deportation, fundamentally altering the region's demographic and cultural landscape forever. In the wake of their military campaigns in Prussia, the Teutonic Order governed the region as a monastic state, enjoying a status akin to that of the Knights Hospitaller in Rhodes and Malta, under the dual auspices of Papal and Holy Roman Imperial Charters. This era saw Prussia become a bastion of the Order, as it sought to recover from the demographic devastations of plague and warfare that had decimated the native Prussian population. To replenish their numbers and bolster the region's development, the order actively promoted immigration from across the Holy Roman Empire, drawing Germans, Flemish, and Dutch settlers, as well as from Masovia, bringing in Poles who would later be known as Masurians. This influx of settlers encompassed a broad social spectrum, including nobles, burghers, and peasants, facilitating a gradual assimilation of Germanization of the surviving old Prussians. So, the landscape of Prussia was dramatically transformed by the order's architectural endeavors as well, with the construction of numerous castles serving as military bastions to quell native uprisings and support the ongoing confrontations with neighboring realms, like the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. These confrontations were a hallmark of the 14th and 15th centuries, punctuating the order's tenure in the region with a series of military engagements. Furthermore, the establishment of major towns and cities on the ruins of former Prussian settlements marked the landscape with symbols of the order's dominion and the new Christian order that they imposed. 
Among these new urban centers were Turin, Kelmo, Olsitzen, Elblag, and Klaipeda, and notably the more recognizable Königsberg, which was established in 1255 to honor King Ottokar II of Bohemia, symbolizing the profound transformation and Christianization of the Prussian lands under the Teutonic Order's rule. Following the catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Sol, the Livonian brothers of the sword found themselves incorporated into the Teutonic Knights in 1237, henceforth known as the Livonian Order. This marked the beginning of a series of ambitious, yet ultimately challenging campaigns to extend their dominion. The knight's aspiration towards Rus met a setback in 1242 at the Battle of the Ice, where they were defeated by Prince Alexander Nevsky of Novgorod. The ensuing years saw the Order's efforts refocused on the conquest of the Koronians and the Semigallians, though this was not without its own difficulties. In 1260, the Battle of Derbe saw the knights suffer a defeat at the hands of the Samogitians, igniting widespread uprisings across Prussia and Livonia. It was not until the siege of Königsberg from 1262 to 1265 that the tide finally began to turn culminating in the subjugation of the Koronians in 1267 and the Semigallians in 1290. Moreover, a significant Estonian rebellion was quelled between 1343 and 1345, and in 1346 the Duchy of Estonia was acquired from Denmark further expanding the Order's territory. You see, by now, the Order was getting quite powerful. More land means more power. And, as with the Church, the knightly Orders, the nobles, it always comes down to land. The fall of Acker in 1291, and subsequent expulsion from Hungary, left the Teutonic Knights in search of a new focus for their crusading zeal. And eventually, they found one, a little more close by, in fact, a stone's throw away. They found a target for their cause in the pagan people of Lithuania. The region's resistance to Christianization, at least compared to the rest of Eastern Europe, presented a protracted challenge. Initially, relocating their headquarters to Venice with ambitions to reclaim Outrima, the order soon shifted focus to Marienburg, better positioning themselves for the conflict with Prussia. The prolonged pagan stance of Lithuania attracted knights from across Western Europe to join the seasonal campaigns, leading to notable victories such as the Battle of Streva in 1348 and the Battle of Rudau in 1370. The warfare between the Order and Lithuania was once again marked by extraordinary brutality, as was the style in the 14th century. With recorded instances of torture and ritualistic killings on both sides, the conflict deeply influenced the political landscape 
fostering enduring rivalries and impacting the cultural psyche of the region. It was never really the same after these wars. This protracted struggle actually spanned the breadth of over two hundred years, with the front line stretching along the Neman River, dotted with numerous forts and castles, encapsulating the enduring and bloody saga of the Teutonic Knights' campaigns in the Baltic. At the dawn of the 14th century, the Teutonic Knights found themselves embroiled in a conflict over Pomerelia's succession, a territory embattled by claims from the Margaves of Brandenburg and Duke Vladislav I, the Elbow High of Poland, each bolstered by diverging historical ties and local support of nobility. The death of King Wenceslas of Poland in 1306 intensified these disputes, leading Brandenburg to seize much of Pomerania, leaving only Gdansk's citadel unoccupied. Unable to defend Gdansk, Vladislav sought the aid of the Teutonic Knights, led by Grand Master Siegfried von Fuchtwangen. My goodness, those German names. Please excuse my Polish and the German pronunciations. It's not what this channel is best at. In a significant turn of events, the knights under Prussian Lendmaster Henrik von Plotsk expelled the Brandenburgers from Gdansk on September 1308 but then, controversially, retained control over the city. Reports of a massacre vary widely, with figures ranging from 60 to as many as 10,000 victims, reflecting the contentious and unresolved nature of the event. The subsequent Treaty of Soldin in 1309 saw the knights secure claims to Gdansk and other strategic locales from Brandenburg, solidifying their dominion and facilitating a crucial land bridge between their monastic state and the Holy Roman Empire, while concurrently serving Poland's Baltic access. This acquisition of Gdansk not only intensified the enmity between the Knights and Poland, but it also signified a pivotal moment in the Order's history. Amid the persecution of the Knights Templar, which was really reaching a zenith at this point, the Teutonic Knights shifted their headquarters from Venice to Marienburg in 1309. They did this to attempt to safeguard their autonomy. Now, despite the growing papal scrutiny, the order maintained its position and continued its campaigns against the pagans in Lithuania, now facing a vengeful Poland and ongoing legal scrutiny. The Treaty of Kalitz in 1343, eventually managed to temper the conflict, with the knights ceding territories to Poland, but retaining Pomerania and Gdansk, thus preventing their strategic gains. This period also saw participation from the knights in the Battle of Legnica in 1241, alongside a contingent from the English Knights of St. Thomas, marking their involvement in the Mongol invasions of Poland. Despite the disastrous outcome for the combined Polish-German forces against the Mongols' superior tactics, granted many of these were tactics that the Mongols had been using in the East and the Europeans had never really seen anything like it before. 
Very difficult to deal with. Very difficult to plan for a Mongol attack. But that's for the Mongol video. I'll do that one soon. In the mid-14th century, the Teutonic Knights were granted an ambitious mandate by Emperor Louis IV, which purportedly included the right to conquer all of Lithuania and Russia, signifying a dramatic expansion of their crusading frontier. Under the leadership of the new Grand Master, Vinrik von Niprod, 1351-82, the order ascended to the zenith of its power, and, of course, the zenith of its influence, becoming a beacon for European crusaders and nobility, seeking glory and spiritual redemption in the northern crusades. The strategic island of Gotland, played by piratical exploits of the Victual Brothers, was ceded to the Teutonic Knights by King Albert of Sweden. This move, intended to eradicate the pirate threat, saw Grand Master Conrad von Jungingen successfully reclaim Gotland in 1398 securing the Baltic Sea for merchant traffic and further extending the order's influence. However, the politics of the time shifted dramatically in 1386 with the baptism and subsequent marriage of Grand Duke Jogalia of Lithuania to Queen Jadwiga of Poland, transforming him into King Vladislav II Jagiello of Poland, and establishing a personal union that presented a formidable challenge to the Teutonic Knights. Initial attempts by the order to exploit divisions between Vladislav and his cousin Vitautus ultimately backfired, leading to a consolidation of opposition against them. Jogaila's conversion marked the beginning of Lithuania's official Christianization, undermining the crusading pretext under which the Teutonic Knights had justified their expansionist policies. Despite the nominal Christian status of both Prussia and Lithuania, hostilities with Poland and Lithuania persisted, fueled by territorial ambitions and deep-seated rivalries. Old memories certainly die hard. The creation of the Lizard Union in 1397 by Prussian nobles in Kelmoland underscored the growing internal dissent against the order's governance. By 1407, the Teutonic Order had reached the pinnacle of its territorial expansion, commanding a vast dominion that included Prussia, Pomerelia, Samogotia, Gotland, Ossel, the Newmark, and more, further consolidated by the pawn of Newmark from Brandenburg in 1402. This extensive realm underscored the order's significant, albeit contested, role in the medieval geopolitical theatre of Northern Europe. The pivotal moment for the Teutonic Knights came in 1410 with the Battle of Grunwald, where a unified Polish-Lithuanian force under Vladislav II Jagiello and Vitautas delivered a crushing defeat to the order. This battle saw the fall of Grand Master Ulrich von Jungingen along with the majority of the Order's top officials, challenging the myth of their invincibility. Although the subsequent siege of Marienburg by the victorious Allies failed, largely due to the strategic defence led by Heinrich von Plauen, the first Peace of Thorn in 1411 allowed the Order to maintain its territorial holdings. 
nonetheless, the image of the Order as a formidable force, a undefeatable band of warriors. Well, that was significantly tarnished at this point. And once you've lost your reputation, it's very hard to get it back. In the aftermath, the Teutonic Order faced declining influence along with internal discord. Exacerbated by the financial strain of a hefty indemnity imposed by Poland and Lithuania, leading to discontent among the cities over lack of representation. Heinrich von Plauen's attempts at authoritarian reforms eventually led to his ousting, with Michael Kuckmeister von Sternberg stepping in as the new Grand Master. Yet, he too struggled to reverse the Order's fortunes. The Golub War saw the Order cede small border areas and relinquish claims to Samogitia in the Treaty of Melno of 1422. This further ate, ate away and diminished their power. It seems that it was all bad news at this point for the Teutonic Knights. Now the Order's internal strife was mirrored by the broader situation and broader conflicts of the era, including feuds among knights from different regions and the destructive raids of the Hussites during the Hussite Wars. Despite attempts to rebel these invasions, the knights were bested by the Bohemian infantry, highlighting their waning military capability. Further setbacks were encountered in the Polish Teutonic War from 1431 to 1435, marking a period of sustained decline for the once mighty military order, as they grappled with both external pressures and internal fractures. The formation of the Polish Confederation in 1440 by the gentry and the burghers, within the state of the Teutonic Order, marked the beginning of significant political upheaval. By 1454, the dissatisfaction with the Order's rule had grown to such an extent that the Confederation began an open rebellion, seeking annexation by the Polish crown. King Casimir IV Jagiellon of Poland welcomed this appeal, formally incorporating the region and setting the stage for the Thirteen Years' War between the Order and Poland. This conflict saw Prussia ravaged and led to significant territorial and political losses for the Order. In an effort to fund their war efforts, the Order returned Newmark to Brandenburg in 1455, and subsequently lost control of Marienburg Castle, prompting a relocation of their headquarters to Königsberg. The second Peace of Thorn in 1466 decisively ended the war, with the Order ceding significant territories to Poland and agreeing to become a Polish fife, fundamentally altering its position in the region. From this point forward, Grand Masters were required to pledge allegiance to the Polish King, diminishing the Order's sovereignty. Effectively, at this point, they'd become agents of the Polish monarchy. The decline of the Teutonic Order's power in Prussia culminated in 1525 with Grand Master Albert of Brandenburg's conversion to Lutheranism. Secularization of the Order's Prussian holdings and ultimately 
the acceptance of the Duchy of Prussia as a personal vassal of the Polish crown through Prussian homage. This event right here effectively ended the order's rule over Prussian lands. Though it had retained some territories within the Holy Roman Empire and Livonia, but these were very small territories, and they weren't going to hold them for very long. The subsequent German Peasants War and the Livonian War further eroded the order's holdings, with the Livonian branch seeing partition and secularization. Post-1525, the order refocused on its possessions in the Holy Roman Empire, establishing a complex administrative structure centered in bad mercantile. Despite these changes, the order's loss of Prussia remained a significant reduction in its power and territorial control, shifting its role from a sovereign military entity to a more fragmented and largely ceremonial organization within the shifting landscape of early modern Europe. After Albert of Brandenburg's departure from the Teutonic Order to establish himself as the Duke of Prussia, Walter von Kronberg took up the mantle as Deutschmeister in 1527, ascending to Grand Master by 1530. His leadership marked a significant transitional period for the order, notably recognized by Emperor Charles V, who amalgamated the roles of Deutschmeister and Grand Master into the title of Hock und Deutschmeister in 1531 elevating the position to the status of Prince of the Empire. This reorganization ushered in a new chapter for the Order, with its Grand Magistery relocated to Mergentheim in Württemberg, an area that suffered quite a lot during the earlier German Peasants' War. The Order's commitment to the Imperial cause, particularly its support for Charles V against the Schemakaldic League, underscored its enduring martial spirit. Old habits were hard to shake. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555 marked a significant shift, allowing for Protestant membership while maintaining a predominantly Catholic composition, leading to a tri-denominational structure encompassing Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed factions. This period also saw Grand Masters from notable German families, and after 1761, the House of Habsburg-Lorraine managing the order's extensive holdings and leveraging its military expertise in service to the Habsburg monarchy against the Ottoman Empire. The order's storied military tradition faced its denouement in 1805 with the Peace of Pressburg's Article 12, which transitioned the German territories of the Knights into a hereditary domain under the prospective governance of the Habsburg prince. However, the provisions of Pressburg went unfulfilled by the Treaty of Schronbrunn in 1809, leading Napoleon Bonaparte to order the dissolution of the knight's remaining territories, distributing them among his German allies by 1810. And this marked the definitive end of the Teutonic Knights' territorial sovereignty, 
transitioning the order from a formidable military and monastic power into a chapter of European history, shaped by centuries of crusade, conflict, and change. And with that, we reach the end of our video for this evening. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier patron, Stark Factory, for his generous contribution to the channel. Contributing to the Patreon keeps me going, so I can keep up this pace. It's quite motivating, you know. Also, I'd like to thank all of my viewers for joining me and watching, especially if you got this far. Your patience is a virtue. The Knights Templar, officially known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, was a prominent military order of the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Founded around 1119, the Templars played a significant role in the Crusades, operating from their headquarters on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Initially, the Templars enjoyed widespread support and amassed considerable wealth and power through donations, bequests, and land acquisitions across Europe. However, as the Crusades faltered and the Templars faced challenges in maintaining control over their holdings in the Holy Land, their popularity began to wane. Rumors and accusations against the Templars began to circulate, particularly concerning their alleged secret initiation ceremonies and several discrepancies with their growing wealth. Hello everyone and welcome. You've arrived at the history channel that you've been looking for. I'm the ASMR historian, and if you'd like to support the channel, I have opened a Patreon, where all videos are ad-free. If you'd like to help out in a more practical way, leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel, so I can continue to grow in the algorithm. You know what it's like. Without further ado, Let's begin our story for today. All you need to know about the Knights Templar. Firstly, I'm going to provide you with a brief explanation of who the Knights were before we go into real specifics of a chronological history. So let's begin from there. The Knights Templar were indeed an elite fighting force of their time, characterized by their rigorous training, superior equipment, and of course, unwavering dedication to their cause. Their religious convictions shaped their military ethos, emphasizing bravery, discipline, and self-sacrifice. Within the Templar ranks, there were three distinct classes, each serving a specific role in fulfilling the Order's mission. At the highest echelon of this were the Knights, the warrior monks who formed the core combat force. Sworn to poverty and obedience, they wore white robes symbolizing purity and served as the vanguard in battle. The knights adhered to strict rules, including celibacy, financial austerity, and of course, absolute loyalty to the order. The Templar priests, clad in green robes, performed essential religious duties, such as conducting ceremonies, leading prayers, and maintaining records. They also provided spiritual guidance to members of the Order, 
and often served as moral pillars during times of conflict. And there were plenty of those times. The mounted men-at-arms, known as brothers, constituted the largest segment of the Templar Order. These individuals, attired in black or brown robes, performed diverse roles, ranging from guarding and stewardship to squire duties. They were responsible for logistical support, ensuring that the knights were adequately equipped and supported on the battlefield. The Templars' military prowess was further augmented by their well-trained war horses, which were outfitted with armor and trained specifically for combat. This combination of skilled warriors, disciplined monks, and formidable steeds made the Knights Templar a formidable force wherever they went. Moreover, the Templars' belief in martyrdom as a noble death instilled them with unparalleled courage and determination in the face of crippling adversity. The famous Battle of Monte Cassard in 1177 stands as a testament to the tactical acumen and courage of the knights, who, despite being vastly outnumbered, managed to achieve a remarkable victory against the formidable forces of Saladin, or, if there are any Arabic-speaking viewers watching, I may do my best from memory and say that it is pronounced Salahuddin or Salahadin. Correct me in the comments, if you will. Now, Saladin, the renowned Muslim military leader, sought to advance towards Jerusalem with a formidable army comprising 26,000 soldiers. King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem, along with around 500 knights and their supporters, found themselves pinned near the coastal town of Ascalon, facing overwhelming odds. Well, amidst this dire situation, a small contingent of 80 Templar knights, accompanied by their entourage, attempted to reinforce the besieged forces. As Saladin's army approached, the Templars, aware of their numerical disadvantage, opted for a strategic approach. They met Saladin's troops at Gaza, but were deemed too insignificant to engage in battle, prompting Saladin to disregard them and continue his march towards Jerusalem. Quite an oversight. A very rare oversight for Saladin, by the way, who was an extremely intelligent military commander, and reportedly quite a gentleman. Taking advantage of Saladin's decision to disperse his forces for pillaging, the Templars seized the opportunity to strike. They swiftly joined forces with King Baldwin's army, and embarked on a daring march northward along the coast. Meanwhile, Saladin's troops, scattered and unprepared, fell victim to a surprise ambush orchestrated by the Templars near Monte Cassard, close to Ramla. The Templars' audacious assault caught Saladin's forces off guard, disrupting their cohesion and rendering them vulnerable to attack. Despite their numerical superiority, Saladin and his troops found themselves overwhelmed by the relentless assault of the Templars and their allies.
the Battle of Mont Cassade proved to be a decisive turning point, as Saladin's army suffered heavy losses and was compelled to retreat in disarray. Although it was not the final confrontation with Saladin, the victory bought a crucial respite for the Kingdom of Jerusalem, providing them with a year of much-needed peace. The valiant stand of the Templars at Monte Cassard became immortalized as a legendary feat of heroism and military prowess. Despite their relatively limited numbers, the Templars frequently played pivotal roles in major battles, where they would either lead the charge at the onset of the engagement or provide crucial support to the main army from the rear. Their participation extended beyond the Holy Land, by the way, as they fought alongside renowned leaders such as King Louis the Seventh of France, and of course, King Richard the First of England. That's Richard the Lionheart, by the way. In addition to these exploits in Palestine, members of the order were also actively involved in the campaigns of the Spanish and Portuguese Reconquista. One notable engagement was the Siege of Tomar in 1190, where Templar knights demonstrated their combat prowess and contributed to the Christian efforts to reclaim territories from Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Following the official papal sanction, the Knights Templar transformed from an order of humble monks into a revered charity across Europe. This newfound status brought them significant resources and financial backing from various sources all over Europe. One notable source of revenue was the contributions made by new members joining the order. As part of their initiation, these individuals took vows of poverty and often donated substantial sums of money or property to the order, further bolstering its wealth. Not a bad business plan. Additionally, the Templars engaged in lucrative business dealings that contributed to their financial prosperity, leveraging their trusted international network Nobles would entrust the Templars with their wealth and assets while they embarked on journeys, such as joining the Crusades. This arrangement served as a form of financial security, allowing nobles to safeguard their fortunes until their return. Right. So the brief history over, you kind of get an idea of what the Knights Templar were doing, right? Well, you see, originally, the Knights Templar were just there to guard pilgrims who were facing attacks while going to the Holy Land. This became a rather large problem. But by the year 1150, the Templars had expanded their mission beyond merely guarding pilgrims to pioneering an innovative system of issuing letters of credit. Pilgrims would deposit their valuables and deeds at a Templar house in their home country and receive a letter detailing their holdings in return. This letter often encrypted with a cipher alphabet, served as a form of currency that pilgrims could use to withdraw funds from their accounts at other Templar establishments along their journey. Pretty clever, huh? 
Not only did this system ensure the safety of pilgrims by sparing them from carrying valuable possessions, but it also enhanced the Templars' influence and economic power. As the Knights Templars' involvement in banking activities expanded, they became increasingly influential in the realm of finance, ultimately shaping the foundations of modern banking practices. Despite the Church's prohibition against usury, that's charging interest, the Templars found ways to engage in lending practices by implementing clever loopholes. Instead of charging interest directly, they devised agreements where they retained rights to the production of mortgaged property, effectively charging rent in lieu of interest. This is quite often how Sharia-compliant banks work in the Islamic world. They still charge the interest, but they simply do not call it interest. It's more of a fee to service the loan. The Templars' vast holdings were essential to sustaining their military campaigns, as the cost of maintaining a knight grew substantially over time, requiring extensive land and resources the order accumulated significant estates to support these operations. For example, by 1180, a Burgundian noble required three square kilometers of land to sustain himself as a knight, a figure that rose to 15.6 square kilometers of land by 1260. Now that's inflation. Additionally, the Templars were responsible for supporting thousands of horses and pack animals, with high maintenance costs exacerbated by the challenging conditions of the Crusader states in the eastern Mediterranean. And despite these challenges, the Templars' astute political connections and understanding of the commercial dynamics of the Outremer communities propelled them to positions of immense power. For a group that took vows of poverty, they certainly seemed to be very good at making themselves rich. They acquired large tracts of land across Europe and the Middle East, constructed churches and castles, purchased agricultural properties, engaged in manufacturing, and controlled significant import and export operations. Their influence even extended to the maritime domain, with the Templars maintaining their own fleet of ships. At one point, they held dominion over the entire island of Cyprus, demonstrating the extent of their authority and wealth, but also attracting unwanted attention. We'll get to that later. The remarkable success and growing influence of the knights inevitably raised concerns among rival orders, and of course various nobles across Europe and the Middle East. Among their most powerful competitors were the Knights Hospitaller and the Teutonic Knights, both of whom vied for prestige, resources, and of course, territory in the region. The Knights Hospitaller, also known as the Order of Hospitallers, shared a similar mission to the Templars in providing medical care and protection to pilgrims in the Holy Land. While they initially cooperated with the Templars, competition for resources and influence inevitably led to tensions between the two orders. 
Similarly, the Teutonic Knights, originally established to provide medical assistance during the Crusades, evolved into a formidable military order, focused on expanding Christian territory in the Baltic region. Their ambitions often clashed with those of the Templars, particularly in areas where spheres of influence overlapped, and there were a few of those. In addition to rivalry from other orders, the Templars faced scrutiny and apprehension from various nobles and, even more dangerously, monarchs. Some nobles had expressed concern over the Templars' considerable wealth and financial power, fearing that their economic influence could undermine the traditional power structures. Furthermore, the Templars' status as an independent military force, accountable only to the Pope and God, of course, raised suspicions among rulers who sought to maintain control over their territories. The Battle of the Horns of Hattin in 1187, well, that marked a significant setback for the Templars and the Crusader states. Led by Grand Master Gerard de Ridford, the Templars suffered a devastating defeat against Saladin's forces. That's right, Saladin came back swinging, and this time, it was personal. Gerard de Ritford's lack of strategic acumen, combined with poor decisions such as venturing into the arid hill country without adequate supplies, led to the Templars being overcome by the heat, and eventually surrounded and massacred by Saladin's army. This defeat paved the way for Saladin's capture of Jerusalem, dealing a severe blow to the cause of the Crusaders. However, don't write them off too quickly. In the early 1190s, Richard the Lionheart, the King of England, and leader to the Third Crusade, embarked on a remarkable campaign alongside his Templar allies. Through a series of decisive military actions, Richard and the Templars managed to recapture significant portions of Christian territory from Saladin. Despite the diminished size and influence of the Crusader states, particularly with the relocation of the Kingdom of Jerusalem's capital to Arca, the Third Crusade succeeded in preserving Christian control in the region, albeit barely. The military orders, including the Templars, played a crucial role in the defense of Crusader states during this period. Their formidable castles served as strongholds against the Muslim advances, while their expertise in warfare bolstered the Frankish forces on the battlefield. As a result, the power and influence of the Templars reached new heights in the aftermath of the Third Crusade solidifying their position as key players in the defense of Christian interests in the Holy Land. Following the siege of Arca in 1291, the Templars faced the necessity of relocating their headquarters from the Holy Land to the island of Cyprus. Jacques de Molay, who assumed the role of the Order's Grand Master around 1292, undertook a significant effort to rally support for the Templars and organize yet another crusade. 
he embarked on a tour across Europe with the aim of garnering backing for his order. During his travels, he met with Pope Boniface the Thirteenth, or the Eighth, rather, who agreed to grant the Templars similar privileges in Cyprus as they had already enjoyed in the Holy Land. Additionally, Charles the Second of Naples and Edward the First offered various forms of support to the Templars. This support ranged from exemptions from taxes to pledges for future assistance in building a new army. These pledges of support were, of course, crucial for the Templars, as they sought to regroup and maintain their influence in the face of their loss of territory in the Holy Land. However, their efforts to organize another crusade to get that land back would ultimately face significant challenges amidst the changing dynamics of European politics and the waning enthusiasm for further military expeditions to the east. In 1298, the military orders, including the Knights Templar led by Jacques de Molay, along with the Hospitaller and other forces, undertook a campaign in Armenia to repel an invasion by the Mamluks. Despite their efforts, they were unable to achieve success, and the fortress of Roche Gulmeim in the Belen Pass, which was the last Templar stronghold in Antioch, fell to the Muslims. Following this setback, in 1300, the Templars, in conjunction with the Knights Hospitaller and forces from Cyprus, launched an attempt to recapture the coastal city of Tortosa. Although they managed to seize the island of Arwad near Tortosa, their control of it was short-lived, and they soon lost it again. This loss of Arwad marked the end of the Crusaders' presence in the Holy Land, as it was their last foothold in the region. Despite still retaining a base of operations in Cyprus and possessing significant financial resources, the Order found themselves without a clear purpose and without widespread support. Things had changed. This precarious situation ultimately contributed to their downfall as they became increasingly vulnerable to external pressure, but also internal strife. Now this is where another main character comes into the story. A bit of a villain. If you thought Saladin was the villain, well, you are yet to meet King Philip IV. King Philip IV of France harbored deep suspicions towards the Templars, fearing that they might be plotting to establish a sovereign monastic state, similar to the Teutonic Knights in Prussia. His concerns were compounded by the Templars' support for a coup on the island of Cyprus in 1306, which resulted in the abdication of King Henry II in favour of his brother, Amalric of Tyre. Additionally, Philip inherited land in Champagne, France, where the Templars had their headquarters. The order was already perceived as a state within a state, enjoying considerable wealth, exemption from taxes, and maintaining a large standing army, capable of freely traversing European borders, despite having lost much of his presence in the Holy Land. 
This, of course, was rather threatening to the monarchies of many countries. Think about how the East India Company grew so much that it became a government unto itself. This is kind of what happened with the Templars and the actual governments, those who were put in place because they had a real claim, quote-unquote, to power. Well, they were not going to tolerate this for too long, especially now that the Templars had no one left to fight. The Holy Land was gone, and there was simply a group of highly trained warriors with very sharp blades and nothing to do. On the ominous date of Friday, October 13th, 1307, scores of French Templars were simultaneously arrested by the agents of King Philip. They were subsequently subjected to torture, particularly at locations like the Tower at Chinon, to coerce confessions of heresy and sacrilege within the order. These confessions, obtained under duress, led to their execution. Of course, in our modern day, we know that Confessions extracted through torture are not reliable, but this was not our modern day, and King Philip was just looking for an excuse. The charges against the Templars were escalated on August 12, 1308, with increasingly outrageous allegations. At this point, they were just making things up. A lot of the reason for this was to turn public opinion against the Templars. Well, one of the things that they accused them of was worshipping idols. One of the idols was a cat, and another was this kind of head with three faces on it. Very avant-garde stuff. The list of charges continued to grow, encompassing accusations of denying Christ, desecrating the cross, and all-out engaging in devil worship. These accusations came as quite as a shock to many of the Templars, who had dedicated their entire life to doing the exact opposite. During the trials in Paris, a significant number of Templars confessed, quote-unquote, to these allegations, including denying Christ and what was described as obscene kissing rituals. Whatever that means. They were also accused of spitting on the cross. However, these confessions were extracted through torture, and there was no physical evidence, or even independent witnesses, to substantiate the claims. They were simply pulled out of thin air. Now, Despite the Templars reaching out to Pope Clement for assistance, the pontiff's response was limited to questioning the arrests, as he was largely under the influence of King Philip. The Templars' pleas for help from the papacy ultimately proved futile in the face of political and religious motivations driving the French monarchy's actions. Now, the Templars' confessions, all obtained under duress, ignited quite a scandal in Paris, leading to public outrage and demands for action against the alleged blasphemous conduct of the order. 
This was, of course, music to the ears of the monarchy. Succumbing to both public pressure and King Philip's concern, Pope Clement issued the bull Pastoralis Preemintariae, instructing all Christian monarchs in Europe to arrest the Templars and seize their assets. The writing was certainly on the wall for the Templars at this point. Now, while most monarchs were skeptical of the charges against the Templars, legal proceedings were initiated across various regions, including the British Isles, Iberia, the Kingdom of Germany, the Italian Peninsula, and even back on the Kingdom of Cyprus. The actual likelihood of obtaining a proper confession, well, that all depended largely on whether torture was employed during the interrogation. The prevailing belief is that King Philip, motivated by jealousy of the Templars' wealth and power, as well as his substantial indebtedness to them, that's right, he owed them quite a lot of money, fabricated false charges against the order at the Tours' assembly in 1308. It is widely doubted that Philip genuinely believed these accusations, which closely mirrored those made against Pope Boniface VIII. Many historians argue that Philip orchestrated these charges to seize the Templars' financial resources for his own benefit, with very little regard for their veracity. Notably, Philip had even invited Jacques de Molay, remember him, the Grand Master of the Templars, to serve as a pallbearer at a funeral just before the arrests, suggesting he premeditated betrayal. The Templars' arrests had ripple effects on the entire European economy, prompting a shift away from the Templars' monastic banking system and a return towards a traditional European monetary practice. Witnessing the fate of the Templars, the Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem and Rhodes were also persuaded to relinquish their banking activities during this period. In 1312, the Council of Vienne, and under the intense pressure of King Philip IV, following this council, Clement V issued an edict officially dissolving the Order of the Knights Templar. Many monarchs and nobles who had previously supported the knights complied with papal command and dissolved their orders within their territories, while some rulers, such as those in England, arrested and tried Templars, and they were generally found not guilty. Well done to England. I guess it's a case of cancel culture in the medieval times. Now, outside of France, much of the Templar property was transferred by the Pope to the Knights Hospitaller. Surviving Templars were often accepted with open arms into the ranks of the Hospitallers. In regions where rulers were resistant to transferring Templar assets to the Hospitallers, such as the Iberian Peninsula, alternate arrangements were made. In Aragon, for instance, the assets were given to the Order of Montesa. In Portugal, the Templar Order continued under a new name they rebranded to the 
Order of Christ. This group played a significant role in the early maritime explorations of Portugal, with Prince Henry the Navigator leading the order for two decades until his death. Despite the absorption of many Templars into other orders, questions remained about the fate of the tens of thousands of Templars across Europe. The hundreds of Templars arrested in France represented only a small fraction of the estimated 3,000 Templars in the country. Furthermore, the extensive archive of the Templars containing detailed records of their business holdings and financial transactions, was never recovered. According to papal decree, these records were supposed to be transferred to the Knights Hospitaller, but their whereabouts remain unknown. The theory suggesting that the Knights Templars used a fleet of 18 ships at La Rochelle to escape arrest in France is primarily based on a single piece of testimony from a serving brother named Jean de Chalon. According to this testimony, Jean de Chalon heard rumors that Gérard de Villiers had set sail with eighteen galleys, along with the treasury of another Templar named Hughes de Peyrot, just before the arrest warrant was issued for the order in October 1307. However, it's essential to note that this testimony is considered hearsay, and is the sole source for this claim. Moreover, Jean de Chalon has been noted for making sensational and potentially unreliable statements about the order, casting doubt on his credibility. He was certainly known to run his mouth off a little bit, so take whatever he says with a grain of salt. So, those charges that were brought against the Knights Templar included a broad range of accusations, many of which were typical of the accusations made during the medieval Inquisition. These accusations included acts such as trampling on, spitting and urinating on the cross, engaging in obscene rituals while naked, worshipping idols, and even practicing sodomy. Some Templars admitted to these acts under torture, including the worship of an idol known as Baphomet. However, I think we all pretty much know that they are not very reliable confessions. We don't need to be scholars and historians to see through this. The specific charge of head worship, unique to the Templars, has drawn particular attention. The descriptions of the head, allegedly venerated, varied widely, leading to some scholars to suggest it may have been linked to medieval folklore about magical heads or rituals involving relics. Most of the accusations are about that three-sided head. So you got three faces on the one head. I know, very avant-garde. Overall, the charges brought against the Templars remain a subject of debate and there are very few scholars who take any credence for them. But you see, within our living memory there exists a twist to the story. A lady named Barbara Frail 
discovered a thing called the Chinon Parchment in September 2001. This parchment, dated the 17th of August 1308, was found in the Vatican secret archives and indicated that Pope Clement V had absolved the leaders of the order in 1308. Frail's findings were published in the Journal of Medieval History in 2004, drawing significant attention from historians and scholars. In 2007, the Vatican published the Chinon Parchment as a part of a limited edition of 799 copies of Processus Contra Templarios. This publication provided broader access to the document, allowing researchers to further analyze its contents and its implications. Another Chinon parchment, also dated 20th of August 1308, addressed to Philip IV of France, confirmed the absolution granted to all Templars who had confessed to heresy. This document stated that they were restored to the sacraments and to the unity of the Church. Of course, these discoveries have prompted reassessments of the Templar trials and raised questions about the validity of the accusations. Not like there was already enough questions about that. It provides evidence of the papal absolution of the Templar leaders, suggesting that the trials may have just been political. But you don't need a chin on parchment to tell you that. Of course, if the discovery in 2001 shows us anything, it's that the story can always have a twist and turn, some 700 years later. Perhaps right now in the Vatican secret archives there lies a document, an artifact, a relic, that will change this story once again. Who will find that? Will it be you? Maybe. But either way, it seems that the story of the Templars is not over yet. The history of the Knights Hospitaller traces back to the early years of the Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, also known as the Knights Hospitaller until 1309. Formed in the 11th century, the Hospitallers played a significant role in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades, alongside other military orders, for example the Knights Templar and the Teutonic Knights. While initially focused on providing care for pilgrims, the Hospitallers evolved to become a formidable military force dedicated to safeguarding pilgrim routes. Led by figures like Gerard and Raymond de Poy, they earned recognition from the Pope in 1113 and became known for their distinctive white cross. Their history, chronicled in Latin sources and later accounts by historians like William of Tyre and Joseph de la Ville Leroux, remains intertwined with the broader narrative of the Crusades in the Holy Land. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If it's your first time here, it's good to have you. If you're returning, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming back. If you'd like to support the channel, I've opened a Patreon, where all videos are available ad-free. This helps me keep the channel going. Other than that, if you want to bump me up in the algorithm, a like, comment, and subscribe does wonders for my exposure on this platform. 
Otherwise, please relax and enjoy the video. Today's topic is a history of the Knights Hospitallers in the Crusades. I hope you can enjoy it. Without further ado, let's begin. Raymond de Bois, 1083-1160, was a French knight who succeeded Gerard as the second Grand Master of the Order. Serving from around 1122 or 1123 until 1160. Little is known about Raymond's role in the Order before his assumption of the Magisterium. His first official act was recorded on the 9th of December, 1124. During his early years as Grand Master, the Order focused primarily on its social mission. Raymond divided the members of the Order into clerical, military, and serving brothers, and established the first significant hospitaller infirmary near the church of the hospital, rather Holy Sepulchre, in Jerusalem. He also engaged in the Order's business affairs, which were mainly conducted in Spain at the time. Raymond is credited with giving the Hospitallers its first statutes, which are believed to have been composed around 1130. The rule of the Hospitaller predates 1153, as it was approved by Pope Eugene III after 1145, but before 1153, more specifically the 7th of July, before his death. Now this marked the official establishment of the Hospitaller as a proper order, just like the Teutonic Knights and the Knights Templar. From 1135 to 54, the order enjoyed an exemption from local religious authorities. Additionally, Raymond introduced the order's Great Seal, which was in use from the 12th century all the way until 1798. This seal depicted the Grand Master kneeling in prayer before the patriarchal cross on the obverse, accompanied by sacred letters Alpha and Omega, symbolizing the second coming of Christ. Now, back to Raymond de Bois. Raymond de Bois is depicted in several paintings housed in the Celles de Crusades, which is the Hall of Crusades in the Chateau de Versailles in France. Alexandra Lamelin's full-length portrait of Raymond de Bois is displayed in the third room of the hall, and is quite a sight to see. Additionally, Two battle scenes featuring Raymond de Bois in military action in Syria around 1130 are depicted in the following room. These paintings highlight Raymond's significant role as Grand Master of the Hospitallers during the Crusades. The First Crusade concluded with the capture of Jerusalem in 1099 but it took until 1104 to fully secure the city of Arca. During the early years of the Crusader presence in Arca, the Hospitallers received donated properties in the region. Baldwin I of Jerusalem granted permission for the construction of a commandery north of the San Croix Church in 1110. However, in 1130, the Hospitallers decided to relocate near the north wall of the city, due to damages sustained during work at the church. 
This new location became the Hospitalio Commandery of San John d'Acre. The Hospitalios received their first castle, Coliath, from Pons of Tripoli in 1127, which remained in their possession until seized by the Ayubids in 1207. By 1149, the commandery of the Hospitalos in Acre was described as a very impressive fortified building by many of the pilgrims who came across it. In 1143, Celestine II granted the Hospitalios jurisdiction over Santa Maria Alemana, a hospital established in 1128, to accommodate German pilgrims and other crusaders. While formerly under the jurisdiction of the Hospitalers, the Pope decreed that the prior and brothers of the Domus Theonoricum, the House of the Germans, should always be Germans themselves. This tradition laid the groundwork for the formation of the Teutonic Order in 1190. But that's for another video. Raymond also took over the management of the Leprosarium outside Jerusalem, which later became the Order of St. Lazarus, with Raymond serving as its seventh Grand Master just before his death. A conflict arose between Raymond and Fulk of Anglomene, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, around 1156. The Patriarch accused the Hospitalios of various religious infractions, and personal affronts, including competing with the Holy Sepulchre by the beauty and height of their buildings. Sounds like jealousy to me. The conflict escalated when the Hospitallers invaded the Holy Sepulchre with an armed force in response to the Patriarch's complaints. Fulk sought redress from Pope Adrian IV, asking for the withdrawal of a papal bull confirming the prerogatives of the order. Fulk then led a contingent to Rome in 1155, but the case resulted in endless debates, and no satisfaction for Fulk upon his return to Jerusalem later that year. Quite a waste of time, and a wasted trip. Under leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitalia first transitioned towards their more military role. Of course, they were around before Raymond de Bois was, but the world was changing, and so was their role within it. An act dated 17th of January 1126 marks the first reference to a constable of the Hospitallers named Durand, who held military responsibilities. Now, while it is unclear if Durand was a member of the order or simply hired by the hospital, this development predated the formation of the Templars by two years. However, the rising influence of the Templars also contributed to the Hospitallers' increased military focus. Depictions from the 19th century in the Salles de Croissades depict Raymond in battle as early as 1130. Can't argue with that. The Hospitaliers' assumption of a more military role is exemplified by their involvement in the construction and operation of the Crusader Castle at Beth Giblain. 
built by Fulk of Jerusalem in 1135 to fortify the kingdom. The castle was donated to the Hospitallers in 1136. Following the example of the Knights Templar, Raymond instituted protections for pilgrims by providing security for their travels to the holy places. Additionally, Raymond hired knights and men-at-arms as mercenaries and participated, through intermediaries, in the defense of the kingdom. By 1154, a category of brother priests was granted by Pope Anastasius IV, and although physicians didn't appear among the order's medical personnel until the statutes of 1184, the military aspect was formalized earlier with the recognition of brothers-in-arms since 1160. Consequently, the order had became legally a religious military order. Beginning in 1137, the order actively participated in wars waged by the Kingdom of Jerusalem against its enemies, who regularly attacked, and from all sides. Ascalon, due to its strategic location on the seashore en route to Egypt, posed a constant threat to the Christians, leading to continuous incursions into the southern part of the kingdom. On the advice of Fulk, the Franks decided to fortify the position of Hassan ibn Akar, which belonged to the Hospitallers and was situated east of Ascalon. This task of fortification, directed with urgency by the Latin patriarch William of Malinese, was entrusted to the Hospitallers especially positioning them at the forefront of defence against the Egyptians. During the Second Crusade of 1147, the Hospitallers had become a significant force in the kingdom, and the political importance of the Grand Master had risen considerably. At the Council of Acre in June 1148, Raymond de Bois was among the leaders who decided to undertake the siege of Damascus. Despite the disastrous outcome of this siege, the blame was primarily placed on the Templars rather than the Hospitallers. I'm sure Raymond de Bois was very relieved when he heard that. In the Holy Land, the influence of the Hospitallers continued to grow, with Raymond's governance playing a decisive role in many military operations. Well, after the failure of the Second Crusade, attention shifted back to the fortress at Ascalon, which at that time was held by the Fatimids, just one of the many enemies. Amidst the siege of Ascalon in 1153, a truce was called to allow each side to bury their dead. Despite facing numerous setbacks, including a serious defeat suffered by the Templars, Baldwin III of Jerusalem was persuaded by Raymond and the Latin patriarch Fulk to continue the siege. Renewed efforts led to capitulation of the besieged Muslims on the 19th of August 1153, with the city evacuated the following day. In 1156, Nur ad-Din and his brother Nasr ad-Din routed a force of hospitallers near their stronghold at Khaled el markab near Banyas. By the way, I'll do my best with any Arabic pronunciations. 
My French is probably embarrassing too. Following a broken peace treaty by Baldwin III in February 1157, Humphrey II of Turon, master of Banias, sought the aid of the Hospitallers to face the Zengids. Despite their participation, they suffered a defeat near Ras el Mar on April 24th, leading to the conquest of Banias on the 10th of May. 1157. However, they did manage to defend the castle, which Baldwin III resupplied to maintain a strong garrison there. In a subsequent encounter at Jacob's Ford on the 19th of June, the king was routed, but he managed to retreat to Safed and then to Arca. Nur ad-Din abandoned his attack on Banias and returned to Aleppo, Syria, fearing an assault by Kilij Arsan II. Humphrey later sold Banias and the castle to the Hospitallers. Under the leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitaller received significant support and resources to defend the Holy Land against the encroaching Muslim forces. Raymond's tenure saw a surge in donations to the Order, particularly from the County of Tripoli, which managed to bolster their financial capabilities. Moreover, Raymond's magisterium marked the acquisition of the Hospitaller's first crusader castles, solidifying their military presence in the region. Of course, once you're in a castle, once anybody is in a castle, it's very hard to get them out of the castle. In addition to material support, the Hospitallers secured numerous privileges and exemptions from the papacy, granting the order independence and freedom from the authority of Diocesan officials, much to the officials' chagrin. These privileges provided the Hospitallers with the financial resources and autonomy necessary to effectively carry out their mission. Among the most notable strongholds established during Raymond's leadership were the Crac de Chevalier, a formidable fortress in the Levant, occupied by the Hospitaliers from 1142 to 1271. Also Margat on the Syrian coast, another significant stronghold held from 1186 to 1285, one year off the century, bad luck. These fortifications played a crucial role in the Hospitaller's defense of the Holy Land and served as symbols of their military power, but also dedication to the cause. Now, Raymond de Bois' death around 1160, marked the end of an era for the Knights Hospitaller. He was succeeded by Auger de Balben, who served as Grand Master for a brief period until he disappeared in 1162. No one knows where he went. Following Auger de Balben's disappearance, Gilbert of Asselet, a French knight, assumed the position of Grand Master in 1162. Under his leadership, the Knights Hospitaller underwent significant militarization, acquiring territories in the county of Tripoli and the Principality of Antioch. Gilbert played a key role in securing regal rights for the order, granting them military privileges above common law and effectively establishing a form of quasi-sovereignty. 
One of Gilbert's notable actions was his involvement in the Crusader invasion of Egypt, where he encouraged Almeric of Jerusalem to declare war on Egypt and expand the kingdom's territories. However, the campaign faced a significant defeat at the Battle of Harim in 1164, resulting in the capture of Raymond III of Tripoli and the loss of the city of Banyas to Nur ad-Din. In 1167, Gilbert participated in another campaign against Egypt, but the Crusaders were defeated again at the Battle of Al-Babin. Despite all of the setbacks, Gilbert's leadership marked a period of military expansion and strategic engagement for the Knights Hospitaller, solidifying their role in the defense of the Holy Land and their pursuit of territorial gains. Gilbert's fervent belief in the conquest of Egypt led to his active involvement in several military campaigns aimed at securing territory in the region. In October 1168, he provided significant military support to Amalric's campaign, offering 1,000 knights and Turkopolios in exchange for Bilbase and the surrounding territories. And they had some initial success, including the seizure of Bilbase. But the campaign once again ultimately failed, mainly due to how hard the re resistance was from the Egyptians, and the formation of a new alliance against the Crusaders. Following the failure of the campaign, Amalric sought assistance from other Western powers, sending an embassy that included the Grand Commander of the Hospitallers, Guy de Moni, to plead for support. Despite their efforts, the embassy returned empty-handed after two years of very fruitless negotiations. In the fall of 1169, Amalric launched another campaign against Egypt, with the assistance of the Emperor and the Hospitallers. However, this expedition also ended in failure, resulting in widespread blame being directed towards Gilbert for the Order's misfortunes. Gotta blame somebody. May as well be him. He was accused of neglecting the Hospitaller's charitable mission and basically ruining the whole order. Well, the writing was on the wall for Gilbert and he resigned from his position as Grand Master. Only to reconsider this later. Gilbert's resignation, of course, marked a period of instability within the Order's leadership, with Gaston de Merols serving a brief but pretty unremarkable term as his successor. However, the internal conflicts continued to persist, highlighting the challenges faced by hospitalers during this turbulent period. In 1171, Jobert of Syria succeeded Gilbert as the Grand Master and played a crucial role in securing the release of Raymond III of Tripoli, who had aforementioned been captured by Nur ad-Din in 1164. I'm sure he was having a great time in the prison. Oof. Gilbert's tenure also saw further military engagements, including participation in campaigns against Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, and his forces in Homs. Overall, 
Gilbert's ambitious military endeavors and subsequent resignation underscored the many complexities of the Hospitaller's role in the Crusades and the challenges they faced in balancing their military duties with their charitable duties. Of course, it would get into the point where people were a little bit confused as to what the actual mission was. Were they there to fight wars? Were they there to protect pilgrims? Perhaps the hospitaliers themselves did not know either. Well, Roger de Molines assumed the position of Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller, following the death of Jobert in 1177. During Roger's leadership, the Hospitallers emerged as one of the most formidable military organizations in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This marked an even deeper departure from their original mission of providing medical care. One of Roger's early actions was to encourage Baldwin IV of Jerusalem to continue the vigorous prosecution of the war against Saladin. In November 1177, Roger himself participated in the pivotal Battle of Monte Cassard, where the forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem achieved a significant victory against the Ayyubids. Indeed, the Battle of Monte Cassard is perhaps one of the most famous battles of the Crusades. Video on that very, very soon. I promise. I know the list is long, but I will get there. Well, however, the military focus of the Hospitallers under Roger's leadership prompted Pope Alexander III to kind of pull the reins on them and remind them of their original charitable mission. Stay in your lane, basically. Between 1178 and 1180, the Pope issued a bull calling the Hospitallers back to the observance of the rule established by Raymond de Puy. The bull forbade hospitaliers from taking up arms unless they were attacked, and emphasized their function and the importance of caring for the sick and impoverished. Well, back to their original job, it seems. In 1184, Roger embarked on a tour of Europe alongside Arnold of Toroja, the successor of the Templar Grand Master Odo de Saint Amand, that's the Knights Templar, and Latin Patriarch Heraclius. Their purpose was to appeal to Pope Lucius III to rally support for a new crusade. However, the death of Baldwin V in Jerusalem in August of 1186 brought about a bit of a succession crisis, with Roger opposing the ascension of Sibylla of Jerusalem and Guy of Lusignan to the throne. Initially, Roger even refused to hand over his key to the royal treasury upon their coronation in 1186, putting him at odds with prominent figures, such as Reynal de Châtillon and Grand Templar Master Gérard de Ridfort. At the end of 1186, a pretty eventful year for everybody, it seems, Renal de Chatillon defied the truce with Saladin by capturing a caravan travelling from Cairo to Damascus, which included the sister of the emir. 
In response to this provocation, the barons gathered in Jerusalem under the leadership of Guy de Lusignan in, on the 27th of March 1187, demanding a reconciliation between Lusignan and Raymond III of Tripoli. Roger de Moron, Gerard de Ridfort, Archbishop Josius, Balian of Ibelin and Renard Grenier were appointed to negotiate with Raymond III in Tiberias. However, their diplomatic efforts were thwarted when they unexpectedly encountered Muslim troops, leading to the ill-fated Battle of Cresson against Saladin on the 1st of May 1187. And it was a critical battle. After all, Roger de Moulins was killed. Somebody stabbed him with a big spear. Rest in peace, Roger. While following Roger's death, William Borel assumed the role of Grand Master at Interim. Borel had previously served as Grand Commander for a brief period in 1187. He then appointed Armen Gold de Aspa as his successor as Grand Commander. On the 12th of July, 1187, Saladin laid siege to Tiberias and successfully captured the city. Despite the advice of Hospitaller commands, Guy de Lusignan, influenced by the Templars led by Girard de Ridfall, decided to attempt to rescue the city. This led to the Battle of Hattin on the 4th of July, where an army led by Raymond III of Tripoli was surprised by Saladin's forces. Well, it did not go well for them. The Templars and the Hospitallers were unable to withstand the attack, and the battle ended in a devastating defeat for the Crusaders. Many of the captured Hospitallers and Templars, including William Borel, were subsequently put to death by Saladin, with only Gerard de Ridford spared. Lucky for him. Hospitaller knight Nicasius of Sicily, later revered as a martyr, was one of the more notable casualties. The captured nobles, including the king, were taken to Damascus and held for ransom. Reynald de Chatillon, however, was beheaded, and he was beheaded by Saladin himself. Saladin wanted to do the deed as retribution for Reynald's numerous offences. After the death of William Borel, Armand Gaul de Aspa assumed the position of Grand Master. The Muslim victory at Hattin also allowed Saladin to advance towards Jerusalem, arriving at the city on the 17th of December 1187, and commencing the siege of Jerusalem three days later. Defending the city were a few knights and a small garrison of Hospitallers and Templars, under the command of Balian of Ibelin, who was the highest-ranking lord at the city at the time. On the 2nd of October, 18, I beg your pardon, 1187, Jerusalem capitulated, and the Christians were permitted to evacuate the city in exchange for a ransom. The evacuation occurred in three groups, with the Templars leading the first, followed by the Hospitallers, and the Latin Patriarch of Heraclius of Jerusalem and Balian of Ibelin leading the last. 
they were escorted to the borders of the county of Tripoli, while ten friars of the order remained in Jerusalem to attend the wounded and the sick. And there were plenty of them. Despite the loss at Jerusalem, the Franks remained under attack at the siege of Tyre. Saladin personally reinforced and supported his troops during the siege, which commenced on the 11th of November, 1187. Armengol de Aspa led the Hospitallers in defense of Tyre alongside the Templars. By the beginning of 1188, the Franks had lost control of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, but they did manage to retain Tyre, albeit holding on by a thread. The formidable castle at Margat, remember that one, was too deemed, too difficult rather, to assault. So Saladin simply shrugged his shoulders and didn't bother with it. The game was simply not worth the candle, and the people inside weren't going to be causing much damage, all holed up in their stone fortress. Meanwhile, the Hospitallers had been defending Belvoir Castle since August 1187. On the 2nd of January 1188, they abandoned the fortress and launched a successful attack on the Muslim forces besieging it. This attack resulted in the death of Saladin's general in charge, Saif al-Din Mahmud, and the capture of a significant cache of arms. However, to the east, beyond the Jordan River, Al-Adil I, Saladin's brother, launched an attack on the castles of Crac de Chevaliers and Montreal, both of which surrendered due to lack of supplies by the end of September 1188. Additionally, the siege of Safed concluded with the capitulation of the castle belonging to the Templars on November 30. The Hospitallers continued to resist at Belvoir Castle until the 3rd of January, 1189, when they were forced to surrender due to famine. In late 1189, Armengol de Aspa stepped down from his position as Grand Master, leading to a temporary void in leadership until Garnier of Nablus was elected as his successor in 1190. Garnier had been severely wounded at the Battle of Hattin in 1187, but managed to make his way to Ascalon, where he recovered from his injuries. During this period, he awaited the departure of Richard I of England for the Third Crusade in Paris. Garnier arrived in Messina on the 23rd of September, where he met with noble figures such as Philippe Auguste and Robert IV de Sablé, who would soon become the Grand Master of the Templars. Among the hospitaliers accompanying Garnier was the Italian Ugo Canefri. Departing Messina, on the 10th of April 1191, Garnier sailed with Richard's fleet and anchored at the point of Lemesos on the 1st of May. Despite Garnier's efforts at mediation, Richard subdued the island on the 11th of May. Setting sail once more on the 5th of June, they arrived at Arca, which had been under Ayubid control since 1187. In Arca they found Philippe Auguste leading the siege, a two-year-long attempt to dislodge the Ayubids. The besiegers eventually prevailed, and on the 12th of July 1191, 
the Muslim defenders capitulated. On the 22nd of August 1191, Richard travelled south to Arsuf, with the Templars forming the vanguard and the Hospitallers positioned at the rear guard. Accompanied by an elite force prepared to intervene as needed, Richard encountered heavy pressure from the Muslims at the beginning of the Battle of Arsuf on September 7th. Garnier's knights, situated at the rear of the military column, faced intense attacks. Garnier rode forward to pursue Richard to initiate an attack, but Richard initially refused. Eventually, Garnier and another knight charged forward, leading the rest of the Hospitaller force into battle. Despite disobeying Richard's orders, Garnier's actions contributed significantly to the victory, and Richard ultimately signaled for a full charge, breaking the enemy's ranks. And with that, we reach the end of the Battle of Arsuf, and the early days of the militarization of the Knights Hospitaller. Thank you very much for listening to this rather long-winded video. If you've enjoyed the content, why not have a look at my Patreon, where all the videos are available ad-free. Or, leave your thoughts in the comments, like the video, and subscribe for more. I'm always making more videos. And I'm showing no signs of slowing down. Thank you very much for listening. It's once again been a pleasure. And with that, I wish you good night.